Jay Dyer and Jason Allen. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Jay's analysis. And yes, I need a haircut, I know. I'll get one eventually. It's been cold, man. It's been cold. So tonight, yeah, we're going to do a book that somebody in the comments recommended that uh, I kind of forgot about. It's not the most well-known work, but uh, at the end of this book, there is a relatively short treatise, 30, 40 pages, called The Church's Mystagogy by St. Maximus. And it is in which are explained the symbols and certain rites of the d divine synaxis. So it's really a kind of a basic liturgical commentary, and it gives the spiritual meaning, if you will, behind the events in the liturgy. Mystagogy is a term that re refers to the rite of initiation. It is a mystery. It is an accomplishment of a sacred action, especially the celebration of baptism or the Eucharist. 
It is also an oral or written explanation of the mystery behind scripture or what is celebrated in the liturgy, liturgical celebrations. Now, uh, if you follow the Jay's Analysis recommended reading list, you know that we've recommended these kinds of works before. There is the little work by St. Germanus of Constantinople, which is a commentary on the liturgy. There is the work in Dionysius, which is a kind of commentary on the liturgy, uh, Mystagogy and Dionysius, the Areopagite. There's a commentary on the celestial hierarchy and Dionysius. Uh, and we've recommended all those before. If you want more modern works, there is the History of the Orthodox Liturgy, Hugh Wybrew. This is a readable book. And it also has a chapter on the liturgy in the time of Maximus the Confessor. So liturgical worship, again, is uh, Protestants don't really understand this. Uh, I'll mention a little bit on that at the beginning. Uh, as to why we worship that way, pr principally because the church has always worshipped that way, and the church in heaven worships that way. So we see the apocalypse largely as a uh, liturgical book. The book of Revelation, John sees into heaven in chapters 4, and continuing on, 5, and he sees worship in heaven, and it's liturgical. It's, it's ordered, it's patterned, and it has the same structure and symbol, uh, symbolic meanings and interpretation as the Old Testament uh, liturgical celebrations. So liturgy is a direct outworking of the Old Testament. So again, if you want another book on that, Orthodox Worship, which is a living continuity with the synagogue and the temple of the early church. Again, a short, readable book. I think this book might be out of print. I don't know. And we will be talking about St. Maximus, and we will be bringing up the Logos, the Logi, so you can read Lars Sternberg's book as an introduction. Not very long. You can also read St. Maximus's book on the cosmic mystery of Jesus, which is selections. And, of course, the old man who is presumably his mentor referenced in the book is most likely St. Sophronius of Jerusalem, the mentor of St. Maximus. And for subscribers to Jay's Analysis, we will be doing book four either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, we are all the way up to book four in St. John of Damascus, which is the end and I will have that summation and analysis up tonight or tomorrow. It's uh, the last, I don't know, 40 or 50 pages. So we're moving right along. We're, co we're covering a lot of ground in this series, the uh, Traditional Philosophy and Metaphysics series. Thank you all for joining me, and thank you all for all the support and the super chats that we've had, uh, it's very encouraging, it's very enjoyable, it keeps us going. Uh, I'm doing as much streaming as I can just because, you know, we don't know how long we'll have all of this streaming from YouTube. Uh, I'm speaking in general of everyone, not in, in particular that I've committed any uh, violations or offenses or anything like that. Thank God everything is good so far. But just in, in terms of, uh, you know, we never know. We saw this week they're going to be cracking down on conspiracy videos. Uh, so be sure to follow the other outlets for Jay's analysis. Don't, you know, just follow me on YouTube because, again, we don't know how long this is going to last. So just as a brief introduction for people who might be listening that are not familiar with the idea, liturgy means the work work uh, of, of man, essentially, but particularly ordered worship. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit of the Orthodox Study Bible's note, which actually they correctly put it in the section on the apocalypse. So this was very well done. And the notes are really good on, the, on Revelation. They noted that it is liturgy. Virtually all students of the Bible realize that there is liturgical worship in the history of Israel. Immediately after giving the Ten Commandments, God lays down how the altar was to be constructed, the Sabbath, the uh, feasts, etc. Liturgical worship is also found in heaven, which is what we're seeing here in the book of the Apocalypse, which is to be expected since God instructed Moses to make the earthly tabernacle as a copy or a tupos, a type, the shadow of the heavenly things. Hebrews 8.5, Exodus 25.40. Heavenly worship is revealed 
in passages like Isaiah 6, where we have the Trisagion, holy, holy, holy. And in Revelation 4, where John sees into heaven, that was what I was just telling you. So the key to comprehending liturgy in the New Testament is to understand the work of the high priest, Jesus Christ, right? He is still a high priest, and when he ascended into heaven, he took his own human blood to the mercy seat in heaven, his deified blood in the ascent, as the book of Hebrews tells us. And he is forever a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, 17, and 21. So there's an eternal priesthood from Christ of which the Levitical priesthood was a type. It is uh, unthinkable that Christ would be a, a priest in the New Testament, but that his serving and his church would not operate liturgically. Of course they do. Forever suggests that this service is continued eternally, right? Hebrews 7, forever, without ceasing in the heavenly tabernacle, that is the third heavens, God's throne. Furthermore, he is called not only a priest, but a liturgist, a minister, a liturgon, excuse me, a liturgos, which means liturgist in the Greek. In Hebrews 8, 2, of the heavenly sanctuary, the true tabernacle, which God created and not man. Christian worship on earth, however, to be fully Christian, must mirror the worship of Christ in heaven. Christ is a mediator, mediator of a better covenant, Hebrews 8, 6. Uh, that covenant is the covenant of the new, the, the new covenant, the New Testament in my blood, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, right, the Eucharist. Just as the blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament prefigured the sacrifice that was to come, so also this light that I have here is really bright, so I'm having the block so I can see. Through the, uh, thus for all, once for all, he offered himself uh, as a high priest in the heavenly altar, which is an offering in which we participate in the divine liturgy in the church. So, given this biblical background, a number of New Testament passages show us the basics, basic principles of liturgy in the New Testament. In Acts 13, 2, they ministered to the Lord, that is, they were in liturgy of the Lord on the Lord's Day. Right? They fasted, and the Holy Spirit says, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. Acts 20, verse 7, now on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread, and Paul ready to depart the next day, spoke to them. Communion was held each Sunday, Romans 16, 16. Uh, greet one another with the holy kiss, the kiss of peace. This is going to be cited in Maximus's book. Uh, Ephesians 5, 14. Uh, awake, awake uh, rise from the dead, Christ will give thee light. This is an ancient baptismal hymn. Uh, and so we see that the church at Ephesus was already using creeds and hymns and we get an inkling of this in 1 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Timothy 2.11-13. Hebrews 13.10, we have an altar uh, from which those who serve at the tabernacle have no right to eat. So in other words, in the New Testament, there is the conception very clearly that we eat from a heavenly altar. So they still have altars in the New Testament church. This is a continuity of the altar in the New Testament with the heavenly altar. Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. We are not Seventh-day Adventists. That is Sunday first day of the week. Now that's just an introductory point about liturgy. If you read one of these other books, you know, they're going to go into more detail about obvious, you know, liturgical principles in the New Testament. When Jesus is enacting, enacting the Lord's Supper, it's because it's the Passover. The Passover was a liturgical celebration. And that's why our churches do not have liturgical, hopefully, chaos Right? We practice the same liturgy, pretty much the same as it was in Maximus's day, as we're going to see. But before we get to that, I want to remind you that in the last talk, when we talked about natural theology, uh, we discussed the point that you can't interpret the world apart from Revelation. You can't interpret it correctly. You need revealed theology to understand the natural world because the natural world teaches revealed theology and that was saint maximus's favorite famous quote right recited by uh, father staniloy in his orthodox dogmatics and you don't get this in thomism you don't get this in roman catholicism because the natural world is seen to be somehow it is divested of the uncreated energies the natural world is not divested of the uncreated energies the logi uh, the principles, patterns, and archetypes of created things are all one in the Logos, and they are present 
They are uncreated thought wills present in creation. They're not divorced. If you believe in absolute simplicity, you don't believe in that. Because the simplicity of the divinity precludes and negates his possibility of truly being present in the world. Not only in the Eucharist, as a lot of people have started to figure out this last week, based on the arguments of St. Cyril at Ephesus against Nestorius. If you notice that uh, in the condemnations uh, at Ephesus, there is the clear teaching that the Eucharist, the elements in the Eucharist, participate in the uncreated energies of Christ, just as his humanity participated in his uncreated energy in the Incarnation. So there's a clear connection between the Fourth Council, the Fifth Council, and the Sixth Council. They teach the same things. And as we fast forward up to St. John Damascus, he taught all the same stuff too, right, in the 8th century. But now we have a, a look into the liturgy in the 7th century, and we're going to look at mystagogy. Now, when we think in this way, then we start to understand that the natural world is not some Gnostic thing divided from God. And not only that, not only are the uncreated energies of God immediately present throughout the world, the natural world itself teaches theological truths. Jesus says a seed dies and it's reborn, and that teaches resurrection. But resurrection is a revealed truth. But Jesus says you're supposed to read the natural world that way. How many times does the typology of the natural world, like creation, right, the spirit hovering over the waters in creation, that's fulfilled in baptism. So these phenomena in the natural world are fulfilled and teach spiritual realities. That is their real meaning. Now, why is that? Well, Paul says God created the world with the intention of the church in mind. The church, the world is made for the church. The natural world itself is the inheritance of the church. We're speaking here in the resurrection. Right? And Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? Blessed are the pure in heart, pure in spirit. They'll see God. The meek will inherit the earth. Some of the church. This is the incarnational cosmic principle here, right? That's so central to Maximus, St. Maximus's theology all throughout. Uh, but Paul says that Christ chose the church, God ch chose the church in Christ before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to be adopted in the church in Christ. And we have this redemption through the riches of his grace, which he made toward us in all wisdom and power, making them the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure and per that he purposed in himself. That is, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might together, gather together all things in Christ, both visible and invisible, heaven and earth. So it's cosmic, cosmic in scope, cosmic liturgy, right? This is lost in the West. The, the West has lost the Logoi doctrine and the recapitulation doctrine. Paul and St. Maximus teach the recapitulation in Christ, that all things are going to be recapitulated. And you can't believe in recapitulation without the Logoi, and you can't believe in the Logoi doctrine, the Logi doctrine, without believing in the essence energy distinction because they're uncreated energies. It's not that difficult. So uh, we have an, obtained this inheritance, and essentially the whole new heavens and new earth were planned in Christ before the foundation of the world. So there would have been an incarnation, whether there had been a fall or not. Now, with that in mind, when we read the text of David, and by the way, the Psalms are all liturgical texts, and we read about providence in nature, and we read about predictions of Christ in the, in the Psalms, we start to see that the natural world teaches Christ, doesn't it? That's how we're supposed to understand these psalms. The psalms say the same angels that govern creation are present in the church. And they're also present in God's heavenly throne. Because the governance of the universe is not just God alone, but God has delegated this to his co-ministers. 
not just man, but also the angels. This is the celestial angelic hierarchy. And this is what, this is one thing that the liturgy teaches us. When you go into the church and you see all this imagery, this is heaven on earth. That's the intention at least, right? This is, this is one with the altar in heaven. But you'll notice that when David writes these psalms, like Psalm 103, if you have a Protestant Bible, excuse me, 104, you'll see all this imagery that deals with creation. And then we have New Testament citations of all those psalms that interpret it in terms of Christ, the mysteries of Christ in the church. Right? There's a mystagogical interpretation of the psalms, a Christological interpretation of the psalms all the time we learn that the covenants are all graceful and they all lead up to the coming of christ especially psalm what is this 106 yeah 105 106 depending on which whether you're using the septuagint or the, the protestant bible but you see this linking of the covenants now the reason I bring that up is because the covenant of Noah is the covenant with all creation. And we see a rainbow as the sign of the covenant. That's a natural phenomenon. That natural phenomenon, though, is interpreted in terms of Scripture according to the historical testimony of Genesis having an, a theological revealed meaning. Therefore, the natural world teaches spiritual mysteries. And that's what St. Maximus teaches. That's why in, when John sees into heaven and he sees the Christ on the throne in heaven, what's around the throne? A rainbow. So there's perfect continuity between the covenant made with Noah, where we see a rainbow as the sign of the covenant, a sign in nature, and the covenant with Moses, where we see a priesthood doing things in a tabernacle, all of which prefigures Christ as the high priest doing that stuff in the heavenly tabernacle. The high priest is a type of Jesus. And when Jesus, when, when the high priest would walk into the temple, right, the temple grounds would be divided into, you had the outer portico where Gentiles who worship could come, the inner portico where you had Jews. This is where like the labor of, of washing is, right? And then you had the inner sanctuary of the temple, which only the priests and Levites could go into. And then, of course, you have the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest could go into. Right. Once a year on the Day of Atonement. Now, according to St. Paul, this three-tiered system is the three heavens, right? So the ascent of Christ... into heaven is a fulfillment of the high priest on the day of atonement. That's what he did, right? So Christ ascends into, into heaven and we have what the first heavens being like air clouds, right? Second heavens being space. And then the third heavens being God's throne. Paul, presuming Paul wrote Hebrews, makes this very clear comparison between Christ's ascent, this is supposed to be Christ here, in his human nature, ascending into heaven in the ascension, right? That was a fulfillment of the priest on the Day of Atonement walking in and sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat, which purifies in an earthly sense, in a typological sense, the people of Israel for that year, the Day of Atonement. Christ is the true high priest, and on the Day of Atonement, he goes into the, well, the Passover, the resurrection, right? The, the true Day of Atonement, you could say. He goes into heaven, and it's outside of time and space. And so in the liturgy, we are participating in this. This enactment is eternal. It keeps going on. I don't mean that Christ dies again or anything like that. I'm just saying that 
because this action was outside of time and space, we can participate in it, even though we've lived after this event. And this is where you get, you know, the cl the classic idea of already, not yet. All right, so we already participate in the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is not yet here. The liturgy is heaven on earth. The sacrifice of Christ is eternal now. And this, of course, is one of the things that premillennialists and goofus is all, they all get confused over this. The kingdom of God is the church. It is already not yet. It is here. It is now. This is heavenly worship on earth right here that you see, the liturgy. Right? That's just basic liturgical principles. Now, with that in mind, we can come to read Paul, I mean, excuse me, St. Maximus, as we work through the church's mystagogy. So, not the same thing as St. Photius's mystagogy, which is a refutation of the double procession filioque. Two different things. So, hopefully this is, you know, straightforward to the point, not too difficult. We've got a good audience here. Glad to see everybody. Thank you, 220 people watching. Again, if you're a subscriber to Jay's Analysis, remember that uh, we are going to do the uh, book four of St. John Damascus either tonight or tomorrow. If I'm not too tired after this show, I'll do it tonight. But we'll see. Um, before I get into the book there with that basic kind of idea of what liturgy is, and that's why to uh, keep in mind that the, the, the only way to understand signs and seasons, calendars, right, this kind of stuff, is to understand that, as Genesis says, God set the heavenly luminaries there to be for signs and seasons. And so the entire universe is a cosmic liturgy. Now, if you don't believe, if you believe in natural theology, that doesn't make any sense because that's revealed theology that tells you, it's Genesis that tells you that the natural world is a cosmic liturgy. It is just as much a part of the liturgy as that is. This is more special in that this area is blessed, right? This is where the Eucharist happens. But you can't understand the natural world and you can't read it properly through the proper lens of cosmic liturgy unless you understand this. And that means you have to not believe in autonomous natural theology. Natural theology is what led to the idea of the world operates on its own. And since God is an absolutely simple essence, who cares? We don't need him anymore. He's just a placeholder anyway because he doesn't actually directly interact in this world. So it's ultimately a denial of the imminence of God or the possibility of Christ or God being imminent in the world. And hence the absurdity of believing in absolute divine simplicity and created grace and then believing in the real presence as Roman Catholics do. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, St. Uh, Maximus begins the work by talking about Dionysius, right? We covered Dionysius. We covered the divine names. We saw that he, just like Maximus and everyone else, teaches the essence energy distinction, reads the natural world according to Revelation, right? Uh, and so this is, again, kind of roughly a restatement or based on uh, Dionysius the Areopagite's ecclesiastical hierarchy, ce celestial hierarchy, and mystagogy. Um, oh, yeah, I was going to read some super chats before we keep going. Boomer Guy, $10. Thank you, Boomer Guy. Have you, have a great name. Is human will a property of nature like it is in the divine nature? Yes. If that's the case, then why do we all share human nature? but individual human wills, because uh, nature is inhypostatized. Right? This is what we answered pretty extensively on the last stream. Natures aren't the locus of action. Persons are, but persons individuate nature. Okay, So the only way, the reason it's different in God is because God has one nature, but three persons. Right. So each one of the hypostases, each one of the person, persons fully instantiates or inhypostatizes the nature. So nature never exists in the abstract. It always is, exists in the mode, in the tropos of some person. Right. So this is what we talked about last time. So keep that in mind. 
nature is always in hypostatized, which means in the tropos or the mode of some individual individuating person. That's not to say that the persons in the Trinity are individuals in the sense of like, you know, laissez-faire libertarianism. We're not, we don't mean that. We just mean particular, right? The particularity. Uh, and that was, again, all in the last talk. So, uh, so will can be a faculty of human nature common to all of us, but I individuate, I inhypostatize my will differently than what you will, right? It's the same energy, the same makeup, but it's used in a different way. Like I use my human energy to, you know, go out and construct a gingerbread house, right? Because I just love my ginger snaps. And you use your human, human energy to construct a bazooka to blow up my gingerbread house, right? So the same will, we both possess the same faculty of will, but you're individuating it and using that same in, human ener, that human energy property, human nature, to do something else than what I'm doing. I'm doing positive, humane things by supporting fluffy, happy things like building gingerbread houses and you sir are violating me by building bazookas that blow up gingerbread houses you see grace asher five dollars will you ever write a book on orthodoxy uh yeah maybe if uh if i feel led to that uh have to i, mean, I would submit it to you know people who i trust who are solid to you know read it and make sure Make sure it's solid. But, um, yeah, there's just, you know, there's a, a time period where I would like to know more and uh, experience more things. And eventually I really want to get into the apocalypse. Um, but there's quite a few more books that I want to read, commentaries on Revelation before. I put a lot of time into it, but, uh, you know, that's one of those things you don't want to comment on until you've been very studied in something I don't just mean in an intellectual way but I mean you know ex existentially uh, age brings wisdom hopefully so hopefully I'll be more wise as I get older I'm still kind of a young pup so I don't know that uh, I mean I don't think doing these streams is that uh, dangerous I've had you know a lot of support from people in orthodoxy so I feel like what we're doing here is positive and helpful, converting a lot of people. Uh, nobody else is talking about this stuff, so there's a need for it. But as to writing a book, yeah, one day. Misty, thank you, $1, appreciate that, Misty Ernst. Lawrence Balanag, $2, thank you, Lawrence, appreciate that. Wesley Sullivan, thank you for all your work. Thank you, Wesley, for the super chats. That keeps me going, appreciate that. Lawrence, again, $2, much appreciated. God bless you. Joel McCracken, $10, $9.99. In light of the church fathers talking about the toll houses like Chrysostom, uh, where do you stand on the issue? Uh, I'm still waiting to read the giant book from the monastery before I talk about the issue. Um, I've read Father Rose's book. I don't really have a problem with the doctrine of the toll houses, but some of the people in the Greek Greek tradition have a problem with it. Um, so, anyway, uh, when I finish that big 800-page book, I'll let you know. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff to do. Benjamin Angrinon, I always get that, I always get your name wrong. Does Paul in the book of Hebrews provide an exposition of Christian liturgy? Yes, he does. If so, how would you explain it? Well, part of what we talked about at the beginning, right? Um, I mean, there's, the book of Hebrews is really a liturgical commentary on the Old Testament liturgy. But that doesn't mean, as the Protestants think, that liturgy was done away with, right? And that's why we see in the early, the post-apostolic fathers, the church immediately adopts liturgy. And there are quite a few clues in the New Testament anyway that uh, let us know very clearly that they were functioning in a liturgical way. There was ordered readings. And in fact, if you go to the major sees of the major churches, uh, we retain those liturgies still. The lectionaries, the daily readings, that's part of how the canon came to be. Those are lectionaries, part of how the canon was determined, are liturgical documents. They're collections of daily readings. 
the ancient churches all possess liturgies. That wasn't a creation of Constantine, right, or some garbage from the Seventh-day Adventists and the Baptists, all that nonsense. No. You can read the post-apostolic fathers. You can read Irenaeus. You can read Ambrose, Jerome, all those guys for the first four centuries. And they believe everything we believe. And they had a liturgical worship. Justin Martyr talks about liturgical worship, talks about the Eucharist, talks about the real presence. Protestants don't have any of that. And that's because they don't understand the continuity between the time of the apostles passing into the church fathers, right? Protestantism almost necessitates some kind of mass apostasy as soon as the church passed into the post-apostolic period. Well, what was the point of Pentecost if there's an immediate mass apostasy? That's ridiculous. But uh, again, so the books that I mentioned would go into more detail about Hebrews. And I mean, you could write an entire thousand-page book on Hebrews and the commentary on, on the liturgy. But uh, yes, there, again, there are multiple aspects in the book of Acts and in Hebrews that show us that the worship of the church is liturgical and always has been. Of course it was. It comes out of the temple and the synagogue. Of course it's going to be liturgical, obviously. It's not going to be Pastor Billy Bob in the strip mall making up his own ideas. Well, I want to do it this way. That's chaos. When does God ever tolerate chaos in worship? Never. Right? The strange fire? Right, remember? Nadab and Abihu, strange fire. So, and you also have in the book of Acts, right? There were many lamps. That's liturgical lights in the book of Acts when they gathered together. Could you do a, a podcast episode critiquing the Gospel Coalition? Oh, that sounds like a nightmare. John Piper, Matt Chandler, Francis Chan. Ugh. Uh, yeah, I guess one day we could. But, I mean, just see my talk on evangelicalism and Calvinism. So, But, uh, yeah, I guess one day we could, talk on, we could talk about that. So let's get to Maximus here on um, the, the church's mystagogy. So he's going to, again, provide a commentary on the, the, the symbolism and the allegories present in the ordered worship of the church. Uh, so let me put this other helpful image here for you. All right. And this is just a helpful thing I found on online. All right. Come on. Oops. Oh, now I screwed up. I scooted myself out of the picture here. Where am I? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I scooted me away. Now I don't know how to come back. Oh well. I don't guess I'm not. I'm not that important anyway. This is what matters. You don't need to see my mug. All right. Now this is just. This is a little more. It's not exactly what I was looking for, but it'll work. Uh, because the structure of the church is symbolic, and it, it's simply just designed to teach theological principles. Now, we're going to be talking a little bit about the structure of the church, but more so about the, the liturgy itself, the worship, because it is full of symbolic and, and, we could say, mystical significance. So he begins the talk by talking about... Uh, God being simple. Of course, he's talking about the simplicity of God in the Orthodox sense. Every Orthodox person believes that God is simple and not composed of parts. We do not believe in the absolute simplicity of God. Indeed, St. Maximus, many, many places, teaches the essence energy distinction, as do all the Orthodox fathers. And what we're going to be seeking here is divine illumination. And because God is, in his nature, simple, uh, he is ineffable. Right, but he condescends to speak to us humans in created ways, in symbols, types, allegories. 
I wish I could bring my thing back. The church is the icon, right? and you'll see here the iconostasis there at the front. The church is the icon of God. Uh, it is the icon of Christ. It is the body of Christ. Now, we mean specifically, of course, the people, but that doesn't negate that the building itself can have symbolism. Uh, and so... Uh, this is cut off too. That's weird. Can't read number one or two, but he says, God being the cause of all things, the beginning of all things, and the end of all things, all things. He is the Alpha and the Omega. All things have their meaning and their existence and their purpose and their end in him and so he does cite imagery from Proclus and Plotinus he is speaking to an educated philosophical audience and so there's nothing wrong with of course using uh, quotations from philosophers or ideas from philosophers that are accurate the idea of uh, icon and prototype type prototype and Christ, of course, the Logos being the preeminent archetype of all things. The created things are the archetypes of him. Excuse me, are the types of him. And he is the principal archetype. So he goes on to say that the those born in the Spirit, they have the purpose then of truly understanding the meaning of these mysteries in the liturgy. So when they come into the church, uh, they as themselves icons and images of God with the restoration of both the, not just the image of God, but also the restoration of the likeness of God. That is the, the deification, the theosis that was lost in the fall. He says that they have re regained their purpose by returning to the worship of God, right? So... By coming into the church and participating in this worship, they are, who were previously separated from God, now returning to his presence and returning to participation in him. Now, all things, in a sense, participate in him, but not all things participate in him in the same way that we participate in him. So not everybody, not everything will participate in theosis in the same way. The wicked will not. So the, tur the church is the unity that presages and prefigures and brings into the present time the true unity that will occur in the new heavens and the new earth. So again, what you're seeing there is intended to be eternal truths being taught within time and space. It is, in a sense, the kingdom of heaven established now on earth. The reconnaissance of heaven, <laughs> I guess you could say. And although things appear to be many, and divided, in fact, in Christ, in the church, they are one. And that unity that doesn't destroy the particularity and the many is always in balance, he says. So the nave, which is this first uh, section of the church here, where you see this number 13, even though the number 13 is not the nave, but where this is there, that's the outer portico, you could say. And uh, that... He says, signifies for us the body, the external world, right? This kind of stuff. The created world, the physical world, not bad, nothing wrong with it, right? But there's also an inner world, a spiritual world, the spiritual realm, which is signified by this next section, right? So in a way, it's kind of similar to the symbology of the temple that we saw a minute ago. But we want to make sure that uh, we understand that that the fact that it's the nave doesn't mean that it's evil. We're not Gnostics. We don't think that all those things are bad any more than we think that the body is bad. But the body should be subordinate to the spirit, 
And this world, of course, it averts and flips everything around in terms of its rebellious principle. So this world tries to make the things of this world uh, the most important and not only subverting the spirit, but nowadays denying the spirit wholesale. There is no such thing as a spiritual realm. There is no such thing as spirit. There is no such thing as soul. There is no such thing as consciousness. Man is merely uh, a biological determined machine. Maximus says, however, that understanding these forms in the church itself, uh, in the sanctuary here, teaching you these theological truths, he says, you understand that these symbolic forms interpret for you the natural world. Notice that, the natural world itself. This is why he doesn't teach natural theology. Listen, he says, the whole spiritual world seems mystically filled as a whole, or excuse me, uh, seems mystically imprinted on the sensible world in symbolic forms. Did you hear me? The spiritual world is mystically imprinted on the sensible world in symbolic forms. For those who are capable of seeing this, and conversely, the whole sensible world is spiritually explained in the mind and in the principles in which it contains. In the spiritual world, it is in principles. In the sensible world, it is in figures and types. He's talking about the logoi, the logi. Right? In their functions... And this world, the physical world and the spiritual world, function like a wheel within a wheel. This is how he interprets the vision of Ezekiel. The marvelous seer of extraordinary things, the prophet Ezekiel I'm speaking of, he saw these two worlds, I believe. The invisible realities from the creation of the world have been perceived according to the things that are made, says Paul in Romans 1. Now notice, St. Maximus does not interpret Romans 1 as natural theology. St. Maximus interprets Romans 1 as supernatural theology. The truths of the spiritual world are imprinted upon the created physical natural world. That's their true meaning. And that's why natural theology leads to evolution and naturalism. If we perceive what does not appear by means of what does, as Scripture has told us, then all the more will visible things be understood by, main, by, by the means of invisible, by those who are advanced in spiritual contemplation. Exactly. Scripture tells you the meaning of the visible things. And those who have progressed in theology understand that the physical world can only be interpreted properly according to theology and revelation. Indeed, the symbolic contemplation of intelligible things by means of visible realities is spiritual knowledge and understanding. It is a spiritual knowledge and an understanding of visible things through the invisible. Excuse me, of visible things through the visible, excuse me. For it is necessary that things which manifest each other bear a mutual reflection of an altogether true and clear manner in keeping their relationships intact. Moreover, we used to say, excuse me, moreover, he, presumably St. Sophronius, used to say that God's church itself is a symbol of the visible world and the sensible world since it possesses the divine sanctuary as heaven and the beauty of the nave as earth everything i've been telling you likewise man himself is a little church his heart is a little altar his body an altar too right emmanuel god with us by participating in the uncreated energies, we become arcs of the covenant. This is typical in the church fathers, right? They speak this way. And we become chariots. If you understand the imagery of the wheels and the chariot and the ark being a victory chariot from the Old Testament prophets, the teaching is no different. It has nothing to do with Kabbalah. It's just simply biblical theology. We are divine chariots for God. God rides in us as a victorious warrior. Our heart being the inner throne of God. Or you could speak of it too, alter, alternately, the altar of the mind, as St. Maximus says here, speaking of the noose, that is the heart and the mind in union. Then he goes on to talk about uh, human anthropology, the five parts of the soul, wisdom, reason, uh, the noetic faculties, etc. Et he says our reasoning is good, right? There's nothing wrong with human reasoning. There's nothing wrong with human intellect. This is constantly derided in so-called orthodoxy, like you're supposed to not be 
uh, you know, rational, you not stay away from logic, stay away from argumentation. Uh, that's not what St. Maximus says. Um, reason is good, and reason is what points us to the truth. Uh, reason has its place, and of course, reason doesn't tell us everything about God, but God gave us reason. Right? So it's, it's just as silly as denying the body as it is to deny human reason. They're gifts of God. But gifts of God cannot be exalted to the position of worship like the French revolutionaries. Right? They had the goddess reason, which they didn't actually believe in a goddess. They just thought that God is nothing more than a personification of human reasoning process. Next, he moves on to talk about the other aspects of the worship service, the liturgy, and the, the meaning of the songs. Uh, and he talks about how humans have the ability to, through contemplation and through interaction in the world, perceive realities, right? So no empiricism, no skepticism. I mean, radical empiricism, right? No skeptical empiricism, no uh, uh, phenomenology here where, you know, what does it mean to be a historical event? Well, we don't know. We don't know what that word really means. No, there's a realism, a direct realism in perception. According to St. Maximus, we really do know things. We really do perceive things. Uh, universals and particulars, St. Maximus says in many places. Uh, so there's no none of this, uh, uh, you know, enlightenment nonsense and none of this uh, phenomenology nonsense that's becoming popular across theological spectrums. Reason leads us to God. Reason participates in faith. Faith is not contrary to reason, he says, page 193. Uh, reason has a role. Reason is enlightened by grace, deified. And it directs us to the good and to the true and to the one. Right. And here, the one is not an abstract principle. The one is the personal God. So we notice by reason that all things do have a unity. And then eventually we learn that that unity is not in personal forces like the Greeks thought. That unity is in, is in fact personal. It is the Son of God. And this process that we continually go through and, and reinterpreting the world, reinterpreting the world, reinterpreting the world, right? Looking into scripture, participating in the liturgy, reinterpreting the world. It purifies us of our unbelief and our misinterpreting the natural world. And this process is part of illumination, part of theosis. Theosis is the divine science, and this is because there is a true union between Christ and his, his church, Christ and his body, and Christ in the sacraments, right? There's not a division. There's not a confusion. There's a true union and participation without the loss of the natural properties, right? That's the same of Christ's incarnation, Christ in the Eucharist, Christ in the sacraments, and Christ's presence in us. It's all the same. It's the exact same. There's one body of Christ. It's a true union, and they all have the same purpose because they all have the same creator, and the log logi of all created beings is one in Christ. Even though they are many, they're not confused. They don't lose their particularity being swallowed up into an abstract oneness. They retain their purpose, their identity, and their unity for all eternity. But their particularity, the many, never destroys the balance of the one. The one and the many are always in balance. And they will be in eternity. Next, he talks about the spirit and the letter in Scripture. Uh, this does not mean that the events are not historical. M Maximus, in many, many places, uh, affirms the historical reliability and inspiration of Scriptures. He does not teach that everything was an allegory. He's not a higher critic, as all the higher critics attempt to go back and read uh, their higher criticism into the Church Fathers. Of course not. Of course not. In fact, he says you have to keep the Ten Commandments, and the whole Scriptures— are, in, are, are the revelation of Christ, the Old and the New Testament. The architecture of the church teaches us the, these theological truths. Uh, he says the soul is a kind of altar where God dwells. And he says that the scriptures can be, be viewed in the same way. Right? The scriptures are a whole. They are a united uh, uh, revelation between the Old and the New Testament. And he says that the Old Testament has a, its emph emphasis on the uh, externals and the bodily elements. And the New Testament has its emphasis on the internals and the spiritual elements. Right? There's no 
setting the one against the other. They're right. they're not in, they're not fighting against one another. They're not we're not Marcionites, even though countless people are Marcionites, which is ridiculous. The whole religion falls apart if Marcionism is true. The Old Testament types then are part of this principle of teaching and revealing eternal truths that were yet to come. But what the Old Testament types show us, what typology shows us, is also that there's no natural theology, because the meaning of these historical events is their fulfillment in the New Testament. Right. Man is a microcosm of the macrocosm. Man is a little world to himself. Right? He has an inner world, his thoughts, his soul, etc. And the recapitulation recapitulation of all things in Christ is because Christ is the true man, the true macrocosm. And because he created all things, all things have their meanings in him. They're not autonomous. They don't operate on their own. The meaning of a fish is the meaning that Jesus gave it. The meaning of a, not just fish in general, but every individual fish, right? The meaning of the pen is the meaning it has in Christ. And he says, in order to understand this, Guess what? Does he say go and get your PhD in uh, phenomenology and historical? No, he says study the scriptures. <laughs> uh, he says that in the scriptures we learn to see the face of Christ. And in the scriptures we see the secrets of wisdom and knowledge. Yes, that's right. The secrets of wisdom and knowledge are not found in Proclus. They're not found in Plotinus. They're not found in Haeckel. They're not found in Husserl. They're not found in Hegel. They're found in Re Revelation and Scripture, he says. Did you hear me? And again, he's educated. I'm educated in philosophy. I've studied Husserl at a graduate level. I'm educated in phenomenology. I know what they teach. Uh, next, he talks about Christ uh, as the high priest and the liturgical ascension. He talks about the in the Holy Synaxis in the liturgy. Um, or in Vespers, it's not exactly clear which what, if he's talking a specific thing, but he talks about the uh, presence of the priest or the bishop signifying Christ, right? Obviously, the priest or the bishop in the liturgy signifies Christ. Right? That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, and he talks about these different elements of the services. The reading of Scripture teaches us perseverance. The songs teach us the divine and creative word of God that 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 sung the world into existence you could say if you think about the uh, Narnia myth when uh, when Aslan creates the world he sings it into existence right he talks about the Trisagion the holy 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 God holy mighty holy immortal and that this teaches us the essence energy distinction chapter 13 because God is revealed and yet hidden at the same time that's because of the essence energy distinction the entire world then is a cosmic liturgy and then he says, this will be true until the end of the world. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all the Gentile nations, and then the end of the world will come. And when the end comes, there will be the renovation and restoration, recapitulation and, rest, and, and essentially transfiguration of the universe according to Romans 8. And that's what this building is teaching you. This building is teaching you in these created forms and figures the eternal realities to come in the new heavens and the new earth, right? The building itself is not the new heavens and the new earth, but in a way it is a pre-signifier and it is teaching you these mysteries about the coming heaven and earth because the church, that is the people and the people in, in terms of their liturgical actions and their lives, they are the new heavens and the new earth here and now. The reality is here now. It's not created grace. It's uncreated grace here and now. <clears throat> Chapter 23, he moves on to talk about Greek philosophers being fools. They didn't get it right. They were wrong. And they screwed everything up in their doctrines. Of course they did. St. Gregory says it's demonic. The teachings of the Greeks are demonic. Yeah, they teach to worship idols and to touch little boys. They're demonic. Does that mean that they, they got everything wrong? No, because it, within this work where he can call the teachings of the ancient Greeks demonic, he can also quote Proclus or Iamblichus, you see. So there's a proper way to go about this. And I strive to do that properly with 
the correct balance. Uh, St. Maximus, by the way, is going to talk about the eternal state, and he says that, along with St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Gregory of Nazus, Nazianzus, the angels and the, and the resurrected, the righteous, will forever move around and up into God. That means that the eternal state is not changelessness, according to so-called Catholic philosophers on the Internet. That's called beatific vision and originism. Origin taught that the eternal state for the truly righteous is changelessness, stasis, because change was man's problem. Man's problem is not metaphysical. Man's metaphysical problems are a result of his moral problems. The two go together, of course. Next, he talks about the Old Testament being valid. The law and the prophets are crucial to revelation. Divine providence is revealed in the continuity and consistency of the law and the prophets, and they lead up to the Holy Gospels. You can't have one without the other. They are valid. How contrary is that to all the higher critical Marcionites everywhere, especially in so-called orthodoxy, telling us that the events in Genesis, the events in the Old Testament are not historical. And what does it even mean to be historical? We don't know what that word means. We can't understand what that word means. We don't know what the ancient world knew, meant by the word historical. What nonsense. The Logos is the key, then, to understanding the entire universe, and the, and the liturgy itself teaches us theology. Roman Catholics say, how will people know what the truth is without the Pope? That's what the liturgy is for. The liturgy is a catechesis. The liturgy is a theology lesson to you in your face every time you go, if you pay attention and if you listen to what I'm telling you and what St. Maximus is telling you. That's the whole purpose of everybody participating, is so that they can learn these things. What is the purpose of these services if it's not to learn these theology principles? It's ridiculous. It's not, is it just magic? Oh, it's magic. I just go to this thing and it magically does. No, if you're not understanding what's going on, it's pointless. And you don't have to do, it's not just an understanding by the intellect. It's also an enacting of this right in your life. <clears throat> so then he talks about the, uh, again, the uncreated light, right, is revealed and taught by this, the noose of man is intended to see and participate in these eternal truths and this eternal uncreated light that he says shines forth from God within liturgical services if we can see it. Uh, that is not Roman Catholic theology at all because he says that that is theosis. Right? Participating in seeing, becoming like unto God himself through the noose, that is theosis. And we become like the image becomes like the prototype. We are made in his image, and we grow in likeness more and more and more like Christ, like God, by a real participation in his power, not by some mere moral union as heretics would have, as Nestorius had, as Protestants have, but no, by an actual participation in uncreated grace. That is what Maximus says. And let's see, he goes on to talk about the second coming. He says that the aspect of the doors, right, being closed, being opened, um, the dismissal of the catechumens, these rites within the liturgy, these, these significations within the liturgy teach us theological truths. And, of course, Christ will come back. So, in other words, what he's doing here is basically sum summarizing uh, chapter 20. What is it? Chapter 24 is a uh, recapitulation, a summary of uh, the previous chapters. And then he concludes the work by saying that uh, he commends this to other men, um, that he doesn't write this because of his own greatness, but rather that uh, he hopes that it is an exercise in humility and that he himself struggles with his passions. I have not yet acquired the pure and enduring fear of God, nor the firm habit of virtue. So he's very aware of his, uh, of his humanity, and that should be an, a lesson in humility for us. Right? Spiritual delusion is thinking ourselves... 
uh, ahead of uh, more spiritual and ahead of where we really are. So let us have the same attitude of not being in a state of pre lest or spiritual delusion. Now I can't figure out how to get my uh, video capture screen back. Oh well, maybe I can get it back by next time. You guys can just deal with all my face for right now. My beautiful, beautiful, beautiful face. You are not alone. <laughs> I am here by you. Blah, 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 blah. All right, so that is, uh, that is the mystagogy of the church. Uh, her rites and symbols, and it applied directly to liturgy, and it applied to the cosmic liturgy and interpreting the external world. Now, how far is this from anything the Protestants talk about, anything the Roman Catholics talk about, anything the clowns talk about? They don't talk about this. They don't talk about liturgy teaching you how to interpret the natural world. They should. Uh, have a thought of taking calls? I have thought about it, but it's a big hassle, so... Uh, and if I take calls, people won't do super chats. So I'll lose all the, the money that I would get from super chats if I take calls. So feel free to send me your super chats. And uh, thank you for the suggestion, John Holloway. But uh, now I don't want to spend 20 hours on Discord trying to set up a way to take. It's just a hassle. Count of Real, 2018, $5. Baptized Episcopalian Anglican and wanting to pull back its liberalization. Uh, it's not going to happen, dude. Those churches are completely controlled by the establishment. So you, you, they're heretical sects anyway. You have to leave the Anglican so-called communion. What are your thoughts on this branch of Christianity? Uh, it's apostate and it's heretical. Um, CL, $5. Could you? Oh, yeah, we already did that one. All right. So basically, yeah, I mean, uh, that's... This, this work was not that long. It's only about 30 pages, but it's a good introduction to liturgical theology, to the liturgical mindset in the day of St. Maximus. Uh, we've seen that it's in, in continuity with everything else we believe. We've seen that he connects it to Revelation. We, don't, we see that he doesn't believe that the scriptures have errors and that the Old Testament's done away, and we don't need that anymore. And Jesus came to tell us about evolutionary archetypes and or any of this nonsense um so anyway that's that i hope you enjoyed that uh, again tonight we will do uh or tomorrow depending on how tired i am book four and i don't see any more super chats you got any, any more questions anybody want to nobody wants to talk about liturgy theology i mean Anyway, um, oh, and then we're going to do Soldiers of Reason. So I, I, I keep, we've done a whole lot of theology. Not that that's bad, right? But it's always good to alternate so we don't get completely, uh, you know, like super obsessed over like one topic. And, you know, we, we uh, the stuff's pretty deep. So you got to kind of pace yourself on some of this stuff. So we will skip over to uh, Soldiers of Reason this next lecture. <clears throat> next show, which is a history of the Rand Corporation, which is crucial to understanding the rise of military industrial complex, basically. Cold War, the mindsets behind, mindset behind the Cold War. <clears throat> and uh, thank you guys. Don't see any more questions. So I think we'll call it a night. God bless. And I'll talk to you soon.